you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet. Welcome here to Legacy Conversations. Uh, we are again talking to Kevin Johnson. Uh, the man served in the South African Police Force as well as in Free 2 Battalion of Army. And that makes him special. And he's been telling us about his life, his childhood, and his time in the South African Police College in the previous episode. And now today we're going to talk about his life in the South African Police Force. Uh, what he did after he left the college, after he passed out as a policeman, and what he did then. And in the next episode, we will start with Free 2 Battalion and his army career. Kevin, you are welcome here, as always. We shall carry on from where you uh, said goodbye to your platoon sergeant, a man who later became famous as Patrolli Nell, with something like an RSN. But at this stage in 1976, he was uh, still a, a sergeant, a full police sergeant, platoon sergeant. So I get to Cape Town. We go to Cop Central, Caledon Square, the back police station. Above the police station, there's floors where all the specialized units are. Uh, motor vehicle theft, housebreaking, fraud branch, sun up, drug squad, so on and so forth, liquor branch. And we now just going to be normal patrol policemen. At the Spec Police Station, during the closing of when Parliament is closed, they've got to protect Parliament. They've got some guys on the beat, and they've got other guys in vans. But the vans in those days were much bigger white vans. Most of them were white, like Chev or Ford, not like these little yellow vans. And I did my, we got there on Wednesday and I did my first shift, 210. Because in those days it was 210, uh, then night shift 10, 6, and a morning shift 6 to 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So I do a 210. And let me tell you, that area is super, super busy. You know, we got like, I should call them clusters. We got about seven written up already, and we're only on number two. So now you got to like really scheme you. Also, the driver, he's like an Uber driver because there's no GPS systems and that. He's got to know everything in his head. And I must say, this driver, okay, uh, Bruderak, he, he he knew that's that's that center of Cape Town like the back of his hand. I mean, he never once asked for the book. We had a book with maps, never once. Just, he just gets there, boom. And um, so basically we are we, we on duty and obviously there's a lot of, there's more activity on a Friday afternoon into the night because, you know, obviously alcohol and that plays a role. But I'll never forget this. On my first uh, shift, we get a, a phone call up to a, um, a shopping center. And in the shopping center is like a clicks or a pick and pay or whatever it is. And in this, this, this big shop, there must be about 10 of these points where you check out when you've bought stuff. And we go to the manager's office and um, there's a young girl sitting there. She works on the actual toll. And these big companies, they employ a company that comes through to test, okay, uh, the staff members on the tolls. And what they will do is they'll come with some stuff and they'll chalk it up. And then when the toll is open and they've rung up all the stuff, then they'll go, this, this person that's trying to now trap them will go, yeah, can I have a packet of cigarettes as well? And then she would give the cigarettes, take the money, but then keep the money. It's a, it's a trap. 
So, you know, it's almost like these illicit diamond buying and that. They set up traps to catch you. And even good policemen used to say, you know, is a trap really the right thing to be doing? Because in that moment, you know, you could actually do the crime. In a way, it's not like necessary a natural thing. But anyhow, now they are there. So we, so I, he doesn't come in. He's sitting in the van outside. So I take her. So now I'm dear Makaya. Do we put her in front or we put her in the back? Because she's a very decent person. And he says, up to you. So I think, well, you can't be fired or you can't get into trouble. Or in those days, we used to call it being a peck. Remember that? Yes. Yes, a peck. And it normally used to be like a monetary it, fine. It's like an internal um, trial. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, it, it can cause you not to be promoted. It's not okay. a criminal thing, but it's internal. Yes. Thing. But you get little pecks too. So anyhow, um, I put it in the back. He says nothing, so I don't ask him if that's the right thing, and we go down to the police station. One thing I must say, he didn't, we didn't drive around with her. We went straight back to the police station. Obviously, now we've got to put her through the box and all of that. And I kid you not, about a week later, maybe, maybe two, because I stayed at that police station for two weeks, Maybe a week or two weeks later, we get a phone call again. Same shopping centre, same shop. This time round, we go up with two detectives from the fraud branch. They ask us to go with them. They're elderly guys. We going up there. You know what we went and did? Not me, but I went just to make sure that he didn't run away. Is that they arrested the actual branch manager of the big store. Mm. He had a buddy at their head office. Okay, and what would actually happen is they set up the tools in a way that the one tool they used to open up from time to time, let people come through and keep it out of the accounting system and pocket the money. Oh, and so he, it's even a bigger crook. And this was a big fraud amount. I mean, a thousand times more than what she did. And you know something? He was treated... Not by us, we treated him exactly the same. But from his company, they insisted he mustn't, he, he, he mustn't stay in the jail overnight. And I just thought to myself, wow, they put, they put a girl away for pettiness, a big king. And that was obviously because they were embarrassed. Because well, that's he had true, you know, broken I, the I... system. I know of a major bank in South Africa, I won't call the name, but they had like a teller also who stole millions from them uh, because she was able to override their computer systems. Yes. And exactly. they, they never pressed charges. They just wanted to know how she did it, recovered as, many, as much money as possible, and then they dropped it because they knew their share price yep. would definitely be uh, affected. Yeah, yeah. But so you see a lot of unfair things in the police, I have to say. I mean, you sometimes find people who really steal because, you know, they're hungry. Yes. And, and they are mercilessly dealt with. And then you get the guys in the white suits and uh, uh, they, they play the game. I mean, yeah, it, yeah. it's just law is not fair. Let me be yeah. no doubts about it. It should yeah. be. Uh, but rich people get treated differently. There's, yeah. there's no yeah. doubt about it. Yeah. Well, the one thing that I, I say to, I should say to my army buddies is that, you know, you have an IQ for the job. But in the police, your emotional intelligence gets sharpened versus being in the army. Um, also, there was a dynamic, and this was like the funny part, is that even though certain and certain people in the military, especially amongst the national service, even though they we were working together in the army together in three, two, what okay, is that what I used to see in them is something that other permanent force guys in the army couldn't see in these national servers. And that is in the police, it was us 
and the horseman. And the horseman is obviously, you know, the civilians. And behind that uniform of that lieutenant or corporal, or if the guy was short-term a sergeant, I could see the horseman in them. And that was a funny dynamic that only I could feel and understand because, you know, at 3 to battalion, there was no ex-policeman. Yeah, you must have been the only one. Yes, yeah. So uh, that was funny. So anyhow, so now the police are really playing their game with us, Lutelunga, to want to keep as many of us as possible. You know, once our year's up. So now I'm sleeping in the barracks above the police station, excellent food, uh, nice canteen where you can drink, uh, each get your own room. You know, things are good. And we're right there in the heart of the city. So all the entertainment areas are around us. This is heaven. So they come to me or they come to the the five of us, because it was only five of us from that area, even though it was a big city, there were only five of us. So I would imagine most of them must have been up in like Pretoria, Johannesburg, etc. And uh, they say to us, do you want to stay here at Caledon Square? Or do you want to go to the police station closest to your home? So obviously everyone says, I'll go to the police station closest to my home. So I get then transferred after two weeks to Mulnerton Police Station. It's just four miles, five miles, maybe outside of the center of Cape Town, up the West Coast. And it's about a 10 to 15 mile coast and about four maximum five miles in but picture this that five miles in from the coast in some areas after a mile you hit thick bush that just goes on forever and ever thick bush so this was an area that had a lot of thick bush so i get there to the Milneton Police Station, <clears throat> and I'm told I got a report for the night shift, 10-6. So I think to myself, you know, it's the right thing to go there around about 12 o'clock on that day to introduce myself to the lieutenant. Because the lieutenant, the station commander, probably got about 12 years in the police. Because it's not like the army where you can get it off to a year or two. You know, you go with a, constable, sergeant, warrant officer, and he was a Namibian, <coughs> excuse me, a Lieutenant Gehring. So he was like in his cities. So I get to this police station. It's a police station of people working in vans because there's no walking on, on the beat there in vans, admin, I remember, and then at the back with the detective. So that were the three sort of departments. <coughs> Lieutenant in charge, and he had a warrant officer in charge of the detectives, a warrant officer in charge of all the guys that were working in the vans, and a warrant officer looking after the admin. So I get there, and there's a police van parked outside. It's not a prison van, but it's not a big police van. It's like in between. And this thing is off the ground like you can't believe. It's a four by four, and it's a blue color, light blue. What I discovered very quickly is that this Lieutenant Gehring, he was a German from Namibia. He used to use this thing up there in the sand. And he brought it, I don't know how he got it right, but he brought it down. You know, he might have realized there's a lot of bush in this area and we're going to use it for the bush. So anyhow, so I get there <clears throat> and these two guys standing outside and they in civvies, but not dressed like detectives, just like, you know, T-shirt. The one actually had short pants on. And I introduced myself, a, a guy by the name of Klaassen and Wotbach. This Klaassen guy, 
who was in better shape than Vautpach. Vautpach was our big set, thick set guy. And then I discovered he played for the police A team. And the police A team in those days in Cape Town, they were playing in club rugby then. They were playing against Springboks. In actual fact, in the police team back down there, Ustades and was a Springbok. So this was high level rugby, albeit amateur. This Vautpach is a prop. I think tight head prop. And the other guy, Klaas, and he's more like thin and that. And I'm standing there and they like, who are you? Where are you from? I said, and then I realized something very quickly. You just say to them, I've just come from the Leoscope. Because what I discovered in the police, you don't go there for a while. We went there straight away. So he looks at me, he can obviously see I'm young because I'm only 19 then, but he probably thinks, oh, okay, so this must be an experienced guy who's already been to Malia school. I don't tell them I'm a Lutheran and all that. So he looks at Vote back and he said, you got your man. What was actually happening, Clarsen was going to the back to become a detective and he was going away to do the detective course and Vote needed a partner to work civvies in this four by four van. And what I realized very quickly, what Klaassen was saying, about Pit, Vautbach, you don't run very well. I used to do the running. This is this dude standing here, he'll be the runner. So basically, very quickly, it was agreed that uh, that would be my job. So I work with him civvies in this four by four and we do a lot of the bush work the reason being these white guys got big trucks going up to the tron sky and they bring in people back and instead of taking them to the townships they were taking and dumping them in the bush sadly that's how desperate the people were they were being dumped in the bush. So these big squatter camps were start, it was the start of squatter camps. So we obviously started to work that. There was another division in the government, the Bunt administration that was responsible for, I think it was a section 10 four law. Uh, but we were more interested in as what crimes gonna come out of this. So, uh, he, they were on duty. So basically, instead of working night shift, I went inside, drew my parabellum, and I got in the van, and that was the start of my journey there. And um, what was nice is that Pitt, because he had to train rugby, we worked 10-hour shifts, not eight, so that that training that he needed and then that rest that he needed for the big games, because most games were Saturday afternoon, although he used to play the odd night game, especially when they used to play Marty's. I mean, you go play Marty's, I went to watch him play. He played Marty's and in the one game when they played Marty's, Marty's had 10 spring box in the team. You know, it was- the university. Yeah, club rugby was massive in those days. Unlike today, you know, some of these Springboks don't even play club rugby. So that meant we always worked on a Friday, but we never worked beyond nine o'clock in the evening because you had to get home and sleep properly for the big games the next day. So we, we worked that bush area and I tell you now, course, that sand was thick, thick, thick. And on the fringes of that bush were lots of independent horse stables because there was a big racing track there, the Monaton racetrack. So it was Kenilworth and Monaton. So the big racing used to go horse racing. And this one dude had a long, like 75 or 100 yard of thick, thick sand and they used to train the horses. So what I used to do is I used to go down there and I used to run bare feet because, you know, there's no uh, glass or anything in the sand. You know, they made sure that for the horses, it's all protected. So I used to do my training there, sprints, regularly to be able to do my work in the bush. So basically what we were interested in was crime. 
not the people that were supposedly under the law then being illegal there. We just worked the crime. So what and type of crimes did you, did you uh, uh, well, find there? The, the, big, the big one, a real, real big one that we focused on is uh, fresh truck tracks to arrest the people that are bringing them in. There were no Perle Moon smugglers or things? Because uh, Mullerton Beach is quite famous. No, no, no. Those early days, it was more breaking in to places um, and the, the, the trucks were the main thing. So basically what we used to do is we, I found out, because if you go and sprint at this one guy that had owned or used to look after about 40, 50 horses for his patrons, all obviously racing horses. And what I discovered is that Wednesday night, was it Wednesday? No, Tuesday night, and Friday night is two very important nights at the stable because there's horse racing on Wednesday and there's horse racing on Saturday. So there can't be much disturbances there. So what we basically did is, is we they knew that we could come and arrest people there that didn't have permits or passports, even though that was not what we did but they knew we could do it. So in a very nice way, we, we used to say to them, we won't, we won't be coming there on, when, on Tuesday nights and um, Friday nights because we know they're important nights for you. But, you know, you've got to start waking up here and telling us when you see these trucks. So we used to get some nice tip-offs tip, tip from, from them. But, you know, they were also employing those people that were in the bush that I knew for a fact. Yeah, I think in, in modern law, it's probably people smuggling, which you uh, yes, were commenting yes. at that stage. And so, there's a lot of evil which went to a fit. Yeah, you know, yeah. many of these were youngsters, young girls, and uh, some would just disappear, sad yeah. to say. You know, these were ordered criminals who were transporting yeah, them yeah. as today. So it's an important job. So I tell you now, I used to walk that bush flat flat I mean we had no two-way radio comms on that so once you're in that bush it's just you and who you're going to meet so in some cases if I hit an area where there were too many people I would just suss it out because now he's walking in there they could attack you or whatever it is well that's the thing about South Africa it's a lot of places Especially if you're in the police. I mean, it is uh, not, it's not a place where you cannot die. Uh, you you yes. can certainly die in the, in the force yes. while on duty. Yep. So anyhow, so that progressed nicely for a couple of months. And then one day, there was five or six houses next to the police station. Very nice homes and warrant officers and upwards. Married. Used to live there. I think there were about six I think the most senior guy that I saw living there was a major, but they were mostly warrant officers. So this one guy, he comes across to the van, also on a Friday, and he says to me, and I think he knew Piet Vautberg a little bit, but he didn't know him that well because he asked us, what do we do? So we explained. And then when he left, I said to Pete Vautberg, what does he do? He said, no, no, this guy is not a detective, but he is incredible working with the gangs because there was no gang unit in those days. You know, there were all other specialized like Sun Up and the drug squad and the housebreaking. And this guy used to work the gangs and he used to break more housebreaking syndicates and motor vehicle syndicates than the actual detectives that specialized in it. So he had a big reputation in Cape Town. And he had a buddy who had a massive um, panel beating business, huge complex. So he used to get the police car that he used to drive 
It was like a Fairmont or a Holden Menara. He used to get the thing sprayed every second week to a different color. Driving the same car, but obviously it's been sprayed differently. So anyhow, uh, that was it. And so I said, and then one day I saw him and he had camouflage on. So I said to Pete, you know, why has he got camouflage on? He said, no, no, he's attached to the onlist here, mate. But he's more in the onlist here, mate, to look for the crime. Whereas the onlist thing, you know, is to stop, like, you know, the demonstrations and the petrol bombs and all of that nonsense. So anyhow, about a week later, I started to chat to him. And I just said to him, as a matter of interest, gee, I hear there's a lot of bush there where you guys work. Do you go into it much? And he goes, no, no, not really. I said, oh, but you go a lot in with vehicles. He said, no, 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 even we don't go in much with vehicles, even though they had Land Rovers. I said, no, no, you know, we get in most of our arrests and that I go in. He goes, what do you mean? So I explained to him. He goes, oh, but I, three days later, I get a call from my lieutenant at the police station. He says they want you to come and join them. So I went over to them. So that was the first time I got camouflage. And I think I was in camouflage there for maybe four weeks. And then we went civvy. And then basically we worked the bush where the unrest was. Because there was a lot of unrest. But that must have been quite dangerous. Yeah, I was starting to become quite comfortable. And also then I made sure Parabellum and a shotgun, or parabellum, and a Heim car. Also, what I had is I had pure smoke canisters, and they can cause havoc. Be in mind that who you were going to arrest were not coming at you with weapons. So there was that wasn't an error where they had AK-47s or whatever it is. That, those days, it was more pangas um, and, and, and petrol bombs. So basically, I stayed on for two years and a couple of extra months. So two years as a Lertelung and then just a couple of extra months. And basically, I was sometimes in camouflage and sometimes civvy. But we, I was more the focusing on crime, housebreaking syndicates, especially car syndicates. That was big. And um, we were in platoons. So there was like, almost like an army structure. We had four platoons. So there were four platoons. One was a lieutenant. He was English. And the other three were captains and the one captain he lived close by to my parents Yori Yordan he was the OC of the dog school in Cape Town because in those days the dog school were actually the flying squad so in those days because they had assembled the, the unlisted and they right squad in that year these were guys who were just all seconded from different things. Oh, there was a lot of detectives in the honesty, and they, they were probably average age about 30. Um, and, you know, the, the three captains and the, the loot had been a long time in the police. These weren't like national service type of officers that were platoon commanders. You know, these were policemen who actually, some of them were station commanders, Obviously, it was camouflage in that days, and we had a beautiful place where we lived and where our HQ was. It was called the Vachianet. So the guys that were involved with parliament policemen and that, they lived there. We were there. Magnificent premises. So we're four platoons, two platoons on, one back in reserve, one at home, you know, 
um, off days. So we, but many a times there would have to be three platoons out in the field. In the platoons, we were constables, two sergeants and a warrant officer and a platoon commander, four Land Rovers, one little prison truck, and one police van with two dogs. That was a platoon. Well, oh, I had uh, parabellums, <laughs> shame the old policemen still had revolvers. B-38s, uh, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, shotguns. Uh, some had R1s. I think they were maybe Heim cars, which is the nine millimeter little thing like this. Um, and then when there was trouble in the city itself, because we had a lot of problem with the English universities and the colleges and all of that, then because I'd been trained at Malia School, they introduced the R1 that had these weird rounds that you used to put in. I think you used to feed them in one at a time, if I'm correct. And that was a skitbjörka. Yes, these fire a tear gas canister from yes. the front of a barrel. So you couldn't use a normal uh, round. It would destroy it. So That's it's, it. It's so, like a super blank. Yeah. <laughs> Something like so that. you must remember that when I was there, just a few months before that was the Unlisty and they'd been established. There was no Unlisty and they, this was the start of the start. So a lot of the guys had Rhodesian experience. And so therefore they were people from sun up, detectives, normal policemen, all in obviously camouflage. So this uh, rifle arrives. And the boy, the saying, Jesus, what, what is this? I said, no, no, I'm trained on that. They go, what? I said, yeah. I was up at Malesko. I got trained on it. Because obviously Malesko spent a lot of time also on riots. They knew it was coming. So I used to have quite a bit of fun with that thing. Well, the training at Malesko was superb. I mean, I've been there twice and then many times for uh, refreshment training. Yes, uh, it, it's a military camp. It's really not like a college. Uh, you you yeah. do wear your camouflage or overalls yeah. or what you had, but it's out and out counterinsurgency and riot training. It's it's not. Yes, it's not yes. police classes. You know, it's not the normal. Yes, and you know, used to work like the areas where the trouble was really, but then used to get called to the universities and sometimes the city. And then there was an area called Salt River where all the clothing factories were. There used to be a lot of trouble there. And I could see the policeman's eyes lighting up and getting excited when we were called out to the universities because now it was us and the students. And then the next famous word kicked in. Um, I don't know what it is in, 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 in English. Hausmann was almost like a kind word to the students. Takara. Yes, hippies. I tried to translate it as hippies, but it's more than that. It's, it's a student. Yes. Think of a student in the 70s of so long hair, yeah, yeah. beard, scraggy beard, and he's very liberal. Yes. And of yes. course, the police are ultra conservative. Yep. They so, don't like each other. <laughs> so, so there was, you could almost say, the clash of English and Afrikaans because. In the, we were four platoons uh, and then two men above it, a Major von Rensburg, and then we had a Lieutenant Colonel, he had a nickname, Kotangaki. And I would say less than 10% were English in that group of ours. So basically this was uh, the Buddha against the, whatever they're going to call them, rednecks, Neck, Soti, the Engelsman. And, and the bottom line is that these people, for whatever their reasons were and their political views, they were breaking the law. And so those 
we didn't have wooden trunge. And you know, there at the infant at, at, at the police college, you get the wooden uh, knuppel. We were given these black rubber trunges. Which had the nickname of a donkey. And I'm yeah. not going to, uh, but they long. They like this. They were quite substantial. And yes, you can eat somebody with it. Helamaxia. Yeah. <laughs> And so we would see these clashes between your, <coughs> sorry, the riot unit and the students there at uh, rioting, and they would be warned, and then they would yes. listen. Loud and loud, everything. And then come a bat and charge us. Dogs, last resort. Me, skip Birka, tear gas, and then attack. Can you tell us about the attack phase? Well, it was more a 3-2 attack than what we were taught in the riots. So in the riots, you know, training, you get the drills and the processes and the steps and that. Yeah. And it was funny about it. Later on in life, I chuckled because in infantry school, you used to learn all these formations at the infantry school of how to do it, how not to do it, and weird, like, sort of, maneuvers and that but then when you get to the uh, three two you just get into you walk in a box and you just get a straight line and when you get into the straight line okay you got overwhelming fire force you got to win that okay and just keep going forward stay on the front foot going forward no lull in the firing from your side well that was exactly the same with the students is no box formation and fancy things straight line and avanta forward you go Yep, and then the punch up starts, and I must say the police never lost. Yes, uh, yes. And I would not have wanted to face the police either, quite frankly. I mean, those guys were coming at you, they were fairly big people, they were fit. Yes. And they were not hesitating either, they would start eating out, flashing out. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> there were two other things that I remember, is that we got to this, this these factories, and I mean, in those days, we were, they were big manufacturers of clothes. We used to export clothes down in the Salt River area, and they were massive factories there. So the one platoon was called up, the one I was in. So we got there, and we took our resources that we had, and we put vans in front, two sides, and the back road. So they basically took up a whole square. And I was in a road that was quite an incline. And I looked up, and they were all shouting at us from uh, the top of the, the uh, floors and that. And they'd been throwing things onto the road, main road, from that side and that. And I'll never forget this, this one woman. It was like tremendous humor in it. She like puts her head out there, and she's swearing at us. And the next minute, she grabs a small sewing machine and she like throws this mach sewing machine at us. Fortunately for us, our van was parked more on the other side of the road. So she couldn't throw it out that far. She just like basically dropped it. And then obviously, no more skip because that's when you get the shotguns out. But I must yeah. say that. Uh, no matter what anyone says, the police were more interested in, in handing out hidings than hurting people for life. No, that's true. You can just see the ominous, which is my argument I always say to people. If you look at the riot unit section in my days, but later than you, and you look at what the South African police counterinsurgency units look like, and you take the two against each other, and you see which one is armed with a light machine gun, the mag, or one's only ammunition to kill. You cannot yes. not kill with those weapons. And then you look at the riot unit, they cannot actually kill with their weapons. Not to say they yes. didn't, but mostly they were armed with shotguns, dons all, um, stoppers, tear gas, things like that. It was never a first uh, resolve to kill. Never, ever. I don't care who says what. It yes. wasn't. Yeah, yeah. And then also, what I then found out is that I used to, when I did have some off days, I used to go watch pit play rugby. 
and there was a chappie that played scrum off for the police first team. And then I found out that he uh, had three guys working for him and they used to walk eight roads by seven roads in the heart of Cape Town, eight roads by seven roads, where all the shops were, all the restaurants, and they used to work surveys, and they were pickpocket. They weren't detectives, they just caught pickpockets. So when you paddle ski and you surf, you can't just say, I'm going to go and surf today. There has to be a proper wave. Otherwise, you can't surf. So what I used to do is I used to live there near the beach, check there's no waves, and it's my off day. And then what I asked him is, can I come and work for you? So some days, not many, probably about in my two and a half years, maybe 10, 10 15 occasions, I would meet him. We'd get on a bus. Um, and then we would go through to uh, Cape Town. Wouldn't even go to the police station. No, we didn't have firearms. And then we just walk t-shirts in summertime, short pants, tackies. And we catch pickpockets. And what was funny about that is he taught me, because I thought, oh, on my first day, I'm getting lucky. And I saw this chap here over there, and he's like walking in a weird way. And he was showing the public on the pavement, these watches that he had on his wrist. So uh, Ronnie laughed and he said, no, don't worry about him. He said, there's about six of them here in Cape Town. They work for a jewelry company up the road and they give the impression that they fancy watches. Meantime, the inside of the watch is some crap watch. <laughs> so, you know, then, <laughs> yeah, I thought, oh gosh, I thought I was going to get my first arrest. But no, we, we, he, he, um, he knew that it, it was an absolute art. And what I did realize there too, because I was always knowing that I was going to be a businessman, that even though there was a lot of successful people around that were generalists, if you really wanted to make a name for yourself, you become a specialist. And that's what Ronnie was. He'd been doing it for 10, 12 years already. So it seems no the night shifts. That... No night shifts for him. When he played his rugby, no problem. Sundays, no work. Um, and when he used to not play rugby, like in the summer season, you know, he used to work some Saturdays. Not all of them worked every Saturday. So basically, he had a, a proper nine to five job. Well, there's a lot of it. But it seems to me that the police provided you with a very rich experience. Yes. Yes. But, you know, the thing is that you could either see national service as a, a waste of time or you can make something of it. The choice is yours. That's very true. It's what you make of it. Exactly. And I think in the police you do learn a lot about human nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what then happened is my dad was getting ill and my mom was telling me he's really worried about my life, you know, my life. And she says it's putting a strain on his heart and I just decided I must call it a day. I was never going to make a career in the police, but I was going to stay on another year. But then I called it a day. So I was in limbo for about two or three months and then he had a friend who was at the health department of the Cape Town City Council. And he said, go and have a chat to this guy. And I got there. It's a full-on English municipality. Uh, but this department that I went to see were all Afrikaans men. Health inspectors. Go, oh, this is nice. This is a nice salary. Actually, a bit more, even though you're not trained as a health inspector, it's even more than the police salary. Oh, I like this. And basically, what they say is come and shadow these guys for six months till the college opens. Then we put you through college. And then college would be uh, <clears throat> mornings till half 12 at the college. And then afternoons, you work with the health inspectors. You do it for three years, you become qualified. 
So, of course, I did that for that six months, then went to college for a full year, and then shadowed health inspectors in the afternoon. And, and what was actually interesting is that they were the only department in the whole of the council that wore safari suits. <laughs> so I was familiar with that because our detectives used to wear it. So I went to buy myself a light green, a light brown, and a light blue, but not the ones with long pants, short pants. But they're the comfortable. Shoes? I mean, people laugh at them now, but you know how hot Africa gets. I mean, it's really comfortable and it and it still looks classy. I like yeah. the police members in the in the safari suits. Yeah. We got them yeah, yeah. issue. And the shoes were hush puppies. Yes. And there was like uh, long socks. Long socks. No comb. No comb. I was just about to ask about the comb because I see you've got quite a bit of hair. Okay, fair enough. No comb for you. <laughs> so anyhow, so that was that. And I'll tell you something. What, what was interesting there was um, in the afternoons, oh, first of all, at the college itself, because, I mean, in those days, you had technical, like auto electricians, plumbers, mechanics. Then you go to a technical, where you get diplomas, because I think in the first you get certificates, then you get diplomas, and then you go to university. So for this particular occupation, being a health inspector, you don't go to university, you go and get a diploma at the Cape Technicon. And the Cape Technicon is very, very English. But guess what? I get to this faculty where there's health inspector, lectures all Afrikaans lecturers they're all in suits and you have to go to classes in collant tie not not a suit collant tie everyone else is going there with short bands and sandals and that so you know it was quite funny so of course quite a few of the boys I would say probably about 70 percent of the students were Afrikaans so a few of us uh or the safari suits. So you can imagine being on a campus eh, with students <laughs> and you go in there, you're the same age, but you've got a safari suit on. So anyhow, you go back and um, you, um, you get back to the office and then the health inspectors would be there. Then you go out with the afternoon. And this one that I worked with I used to wear a pants, a tie, you know, about a safari suit and a jacket. And he was doing like a higher diploma. And he had actually become very good friends with one of the restaurants in that area. Because, I mean, yeah, restaurants are, are places that get checked. And he was doing a higher diploma there. And um, this restaurant owner was from Italy. And he had two very expensive restaurants in Cape Town. And his father had a deli in Italy, but his father was in the military. So one day we were chatting there and I said to him, you know, what makes you good as a restaurant owner? Because I'm interested in business. And he said, oh, no, my dad said, you know, it's the military discipline that you've got to have in a restaurant and that. So basically what he was doing with this health inspector that I used to shadow, he used to get this health inspector to be his policeman. So rather than a restaurant now getting a surprise visit from a health inspector, he used to get this health inspector to come regularly to his place and check him so that he can say to the staff, you see, that's not right in the kitchen. This is not right. This is not right. So basically, he was being proactive in his business. And for that, we used to go there once a month on a Friday after college and used to have a full-on meal there. I never forget it. My favorite used to be spaghetti, lobster, and a filet steak with chips. But That's a grappa, nice because it's Italian, but a grappa there after your meal and all that. So anyhow, we're sitting there, and in the restaurant, it's just all men in suits. You can see a lot of wealth. And then one day, these two big guys come in and they got safari suits on with long pants. So this in health inspector says to me, oh, you got company. They probably work for the bank. 
in those days, it was a trust bank, Afrikaans bank. Oh, they probably work for trust bank. So they sit there and I look at the one guy, I think, geez, I know you. And then I realize, ah, oh, I've met him, at, not physically, but I'd seen him at the rugby. He was an AJ in the police. So they were sitting there and it was the same thing. All crime inside the restaurant and crime in the area outside. He befriended these two guys. And so they used, they used to come there for a lunch on the odd occasion. And, you know, they used to, he used to obviously get certain um, services from them. And it was all like how his father taught him, just surround yourself with all this stuff so there's never no nonsense. Because, you know, in those days, if there was something that went wrong in his restaurant, like stuff being stolen, it would be a bad name. And then also, I would imagine with the staff, knowing that Mario is friends with these two big detectives, you know, they're going to think seconds about stealing meat in the kitchen. Well, it's clever business. It's all yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyhow, so this guy's doing his higher diploma, and it's he's using that obviously that restaurant, and he's taking photos in the kitchen for whatever he's doing with his higher diploma. And then one day he says to me, "Oh, you know, Susan from the food technologist in the health department, she's coming to lunch as well." So she was an English lady here from England, and she was like working just under the doctor in the food technology department where they do all the testings and samples and that. I said, oh, no, that's fine. He says, but uh, can I ask you a favour? She, she said to him, look here, because he obviously told her that I'm shadowing him. She don't like going to restaurants with men with safari suits on. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that particular day, I, I had to go to college with a normal collar and tie because she didn't want to be seen in this fancy restaurant, sitting with two men and the ones in a safari suit, but not just a safari, a safari suit, a safari suit with short pants and socks. <laughs> oh, it's an interesting... But, so unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, my dad didn't make it beyond the end of that year. And I just knew in my heart, I'm not ready for the business world. I don't want to do this type of work because... There's not much money when you get older and you get married. Uh, and I don't have the that adventure out of me yet. So I was thinking of, you know, you go abroad on this Contiki tour or whatever it is. And I decided, no, I never got to Rhodesia. So now I'm going to do something. And then I found out about 3-2 Battalion. And that dad died end of December, early yeah, end of December or early January, I can't remember. And uh, I was on a train in the first week of February up to three side. Kevin, thank you very much for talking to us. It's really interesting. I'm fascinated by these stories because, you know, this is not the type of thing you're ever going to read in a book or in the major series on, on television or any place like that. And therefore, it's important that we capture these, these memories before they get lost. As always, I say to you listening, yeah, if you have a story to tell us, then please come forward. Uh, contact me and let us get together. Let us record your story, uh, but it uh, will not get lost. And somebody else you know, might learn from it. In the next episode, we're turning to uh, Kevin's army career. And that's going to be very, very interesting. And it will not be on the police list. It will be on the army list. Uh, that's where we will find it, on the SADF playlist. Thank you, Kevin. We really appreciate your time. And to all of you out there, be safe. God bless. And thank you for watching.